In the early 2000s, one of the largest speedrunning communities out there was for the classic NES game Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Dozens of players from all over the world competed with each other to set the fastest times they could on each of the 14 fighters, tracked with the in-game timer displayed during and after the fight. It was a thriving community. These guys sent emails back and forth detailing their strategies, posting on old websites like GameFAQs, and kept track of their fastest times using online leaderboards. There was a really fun mix of randomness and skill involved. New strategies for faster times were regularly found, keeping the game fresh and encouraging others to see just what they could discover. For years, Punch-Out! remained as one of the most popular speedrun communities in the world. But by the mid-2000s, competition slowed down. People kinda just stopped playing the game, and in a matter of months, one of the most played speedruns out there suddenly lost all of its competition, and silently faded into the background while other games took its spot. By 2008, just about nobody was playing the game anymore. But then, in 2010, a player known as Sinister One became the first player to speedrun the game in years. What he found was a deserted community. The game FAQs pages with strategy discussion had been deleted, emails sent back and forth had long been forgotten, and pretty much all that remained was a website called Red Tom's Punch-Out, with a leaderboard that showed what the world record was for each of the 14 fights. Sinister One was shocked by what he saw here. All 14 records were held by the same guy, a person named Matt Turk. None of them had any videos for proof, and it was hard to even find evidence on how Turk did each of these fights. After finding Matt Turk's email address and talking with him a bit, Sinister realized a couple of things. First, all signs pointed to every single one of these records being legitimate. And second, Matt Turk's skill level was way, way beyond any other player in the world, and there was pretty much no hope in anybody else beating some of them. At least, that's what he thought. These are the 14 world record times that Matt Turk had achieved by the time Sinister rediscovered the leaderboard. They didn't have video proof to go with them, but especially given when they were performed, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Hardly anybody was uploading speedruns to the internet in the early 2000s. Turk did, however, write down some of his strategies in detail on Red Tom's Punch-Out site, explaining how he achieved many of his times and how others could do the same. He played the game for a decade and came up with so much. In my opinion, it's very likely that he performed all of his times legitimately. But to understand how good they were, we'll have to first understand the basics of the game. Punch-Out mainly involves dodging out of the way of your opponent's punches and hitting them with your own punches courtesy of the fists of Little Mac. Punching your opponent lowers their health bar and can eventually lead to a knockdown. Three knockdowns in one round is a TKO, which will end the fight. It's also possible to KO some fighters, where they don't get up after Mario the referee counts to 10 and the fight ends. So, Turk achieved these 14 times from either TKOing or KOing each fighter. We'll break down how he did them later, but for Sinister One to beat or tie most of them seemed out of the question. Thankfully though, two of them were world record freebies that anybody watching this could match with a little bit of practice. Glass Joe and Don Flamenco. Glass Joe is an infamously easy fight, and his world record is infamously easy to attain as well. His strategy simply involved waiting until he did his attack at 40 seconds. A well-timed punch to the face upon him charging forward will knock him down in 42 seconds, where he won't be able to get up and the fight will end at 42.00. Punch-Out runs at 60 frames per second, and there's two frames to time this punch for Glass Joe to get knocked down and stay down at 42.00. This world record has been at 42.00 probably ever since the game came out in 1987. The second relatively easy record is on Don Flamenco, the fourth fight in the game, with a strategy discovered by Martin Charlebois in the late 90s. 
To tie this record, Sinister had to punch him, dodge out of the way, then wait and punch Don Flamenco in the face on the last frame before he would block the punch. If he's able to land it in the 60th of a second window, he'll get a star punch, or an uppercut that deals more damage. To Don Flamenco, this punch does enough to automatically knock him down. He gets up, but upon dodging his punch and hitting him in the face 5 times, Don Flamenco goes down again and doesn't get up. It'll be a KO at 14.97 seconds, a world record that has been tied for at least 2 decades. Sinister tied both of those records in early 2010, but after that it was going to be a lot tougher to knock any down. No more freebies. Now, he had to practice and try to improve his skills at the game. Throughout 2010, Sinister One got a lot better at the game and lowered each of his 14 times down, but they still remained comfortably behind Turk's times. Thankfully though, he got some help later that year. A player known as Adelicott was interested in the Hippo record, which was another one that Turk had reached the theoretical lowest time on, 37.61. To pull it off, however, was another story. King Hippo is a super random fighter. On any punch he throws, he can either open his mouth or not. He has a 3 in 8 chance of opening on any given punch, and you can only hit Hippo when he opens his mouth. He needs to open his mouth 3 times in order for you to deal enough damage to beat him, so to get the fastest time possible, you need Hippo to open his mouth on each of the first 3 times he throws a punch. That's 3 eighths times 3 eighths times 3 eighths, or about 5.27%. But that's not all. Half the time, he also does a delay between his second and third punches. To get Turk's time of 37 seconds, he can't do that delay, which cuts the odds in half. So the sheer odds in getting the luck needed for this time were only about 2.64%. The execution was extremely precise as well, because of how the in-game timer works. It ticks faster than a real second, with an in-game second being made up of about 20 individual frames, or a third of a real second. For some reason, the programmers only made certain decimals possible to achieve on each fight. 0 0.00, 0 0.25, 0 0.48, 0 0.61, 0 0.82, 0 0.97, and 0.99. If you end the fight in the first few frames of an in-game second, you get 0 0.00. In the next few frames, you get 0 0.25, and so on all the way to 0.99. His time of 37.61 meant he could lose up to 2 frames before actually losing time and getting a 37.82. On average, you have to hit Hippo on either the first or second frame he opens his mouth on each punch. That is some really precise timing. Now keep in mind, even if you're able to execute that precisely, you only have a 1 in 40 chance of getting the correct pattern from Hippo. Sinister One's fastest time was a 37.97. But in October 2010, Adelicott came through and tied Turk's 37.61, which I mentioned before can't go lower at all. What's crazy is that even with all that randomness and execution, that was still considered one of Turk's easier records to match. With that, the Punch-Out! community had managed to take down three of Turk's times. But these three all had something in common. Of Turk's 14 records, it was known that four of them were at their theoretical limit and couldn't be beaten, only tied. It had been known for years that you couldn't go under 42.00 on Glass Joe, under 14.97 on Don Flamenco, and under 37.61 on King Hippo, and all three of those times stand as the world records even today. But for most of the remaining fights, the limit on how low humans could go was unknown. Turk's times were incredible, but for most of them it was at least theoretically possible to take them a decimal lower. But in order to do that, you would need to either beat Turk's execution, or get better luck, or both. Enter Mr. Sandman. Turk's Sandman time was 220.00, the slowest of all 14 fights, but that doesn't mean it was his worst. You can't get star punches on Mr. Sandman to deal damage quickly, so even beating him in the first round is hard. We'll get into the actual strategy behind this fight soon, but in 2010, Sinister One was able to tie Turk's 220. 
It seemed like it was just another Turk time down, but then Turk actually responded and beat Sinister's time with a claimed 219.48, once again with no video. Sinister would get a 219.97 that wasn't recorded, but he couldn't compete against a 219.48. So Turk was back on top, and his time once again stood unrivaled. Until a guy named Zallard1 got his hands on the game. Yes, dude! Holy shit! What? Zallard began playing Mike Tyson's Punch-Out seriously in early 2013. One fight he gravitated to early on was none other than Mr. Sandman. This fight from July 2013 shows his strategy to beat Mr. Sandman quickly. Fights in Punch-Out can be broken down into phases, with Phase 1 being up until the boxer's first knockdown, Phase 2 being until the second knockdown, and Phase 3 being until the TKO. The first phase of the fight involves dodging out of the way of Sandman's rolling jabs and hitting him in the face. You also get hit a couple of times on purpose, and you'll see why later. There's two 50-50 random delays Sandman could do, and he did one of them, leading to a 120 first knockdown. Phase 2 involved hitting Sandman a bit more, then a random delay from Sandman before his Dreamland Express pattern. Three extremely quick uppercuts that you have to avoid getting hit by. Zallard got the shortest delay from Mr. Sandman and then pressed left up, left up, and left up really quickly in sequence to dodge the Dreamland Express. This allowed him to hit Mr. Sandman in the gut 18 times in a row to deal damage extremely quickly and send him down for a second time. Now here's where getting hit comes into play. It turns out that Mr. Sandman is programmed to do another Dreamland Express pattern if Little Matt gets knocked down at 159 or later into the fight. So a player named Jack Wedge figured out that by pressing select before the fight to lower your health to half, taking damage early in the fight, and then getting knocked down on purpose after Sandman's second knockdown, you can end the fight quickly after he does a second Dreamland Express. Yes. Fuck yes, dude! Oh my god! Holy shit! What the fuck? Oh my god! <laughs> I can't believe that! This time from Zallard tied Sinister's 219, but he could still save a second in Phase 1 by not getting the random delay that Sandman gave him. But adding all that luck up across all three phases got crazy. He needed neither of Sandman's Phase 1 delays, the shortest delay for the first Dreamland Express, then a good health refill from Mr. Sandman for Phase 3, and the short delay for his last Dreamland Express. That put the odds at 2.34%. But even once Zallard got all of that luck, he also needed to just not mess up. Yes! Oh my god, what is it? What is it? What is it? Holy shit, dude! Oh my god! I did it. I actually, this is it. I beat him at Turk time. At long last, one of Turk's times had actually been beaten. Zallard1 was the guy to do it, and his time was celebrated across the Punch-Out community. It broke new ground, and made Turk seem not invincible for the first time since Sinister came onto the scene in 2010. It had taken three years for anybody to officially beat any of Turk's records. Four times down, but Turk still had 10 records all to himself. One of Turk's finest times was his Piston Honda 2 record, 50.97. This time was remarkably close to the Tool Assisted record for Honda 2, which was 50.25 seconds. A Tool Assisted speedrun, or TAS, can create a theoretically perfect time by using save states, slowing down time, and even going frame by frame to enter inputs. 50.25 wasn't a real speedrun, but a demonstration of the fastest time possible, and Turk was just frames away from matching it. He was able to get it by doing guard manipulation, where you can fuse Piston Honda by tapping and releasing up at strategic points to move his guard around so he can't block max punches. It's extremely difficult, and at one point requires a frame-perfect punch to the face while his guard is in a moment of weakness. Matt Turk's time mirrored the theoretical tool assisted time, probably just losing a bit of time from losing frames from imperfect execution. Needless to say, beating Turk's Honda 2 time was nearly impossible, so it stood unrivaled with all of his other records. 
Meanwhile, in the years following Sinister One's initial punch-out grind, he had focused much of his efforts playing single segments, where you play the game from start to finish and add up your times in each of the 14 fights. He streamed his attempts live on his Twitch channel, and people had gotten used to him speedrunning the full game. But then one day in August 2013, he just started up a stream of Piston Honda 2 world record attempts. Keep in mind Turk's record is 50.97, and it was impossible to go under 50.25, so there wasn't much room to get a world record. At least, that's what everybody thought. That's it, that's it, that's it! I just beat the fucking Taz. Oh my god, I'm holding start so hard right now. I'm holding start more than I've ever held it in my life. Yes! Fuck yes! Fuck yes! Fuck yes! I just beat the Taz! I just beat the motherfucking Taz! Oh my god! It's gonna be a low 48. 48 flat. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> oh my god. I can't believe this is real. He had just beaten the theoretically perfect tool-assisted speedrun by more than two seconds. Sinister had just pulled off a fight with his own two hands faster than anybody had been able to even theoretically figure out with an emulator. What had just happened? Well, unknown to everyone watching his stream, a few days prior someone had figured out how to beat that theoretical Piston Honda 2 record. His name was McHazard, and after discovering it, he privately messaged Sinister1 to tell him about his findings. The main issue with the old tool assisted time was here in phase 2, where he had to wait a long time before throwing a star punch. Honda normally starts dodging any star punches you throw at him after the third one, but if you wait to throw it until he's doing his appropriately named eyebrow pattern, it'll land and deal damage. So the tool assisted record had to stand still and wait until the eyebrow pattern began. McHazard figured out a way around that. He discovered that Pissin Honda 2 has a bizarre mechanic that few other fighters in the game have max damage uppercuts. When Honda's guard is down, you can press up and start to throw a star punch uppercut, then let go of up when Honda brings his gloves up. For whatever reason, if performed correctly, then not only can Honda not dodge this punch, but it also deals more damage than a normal star punch. So Sinister simply implemented this max damage star punch when he would normally be waiting for the eyebrow pattern in phase 2, and sent him down about 5 seconds faster than normal. Over the following months, McHazard would broaden his search for faster strategies to all 14 fights, and ultimately made a new, faster tool-assisted speedrun of the entire game. It featured improvements to 8 of the 14 fights, meaning 8 fights now had new theoretical load times that humans could try to get closer to. For the past few years, the only times of Turk that had been toppled were ones that were already theoretically perfect, or ones that were more obviously imperfect like Mr. Sandman. But with this new tool-assisted speedrun, the horizon expanded so much. McHazard had completely changed the playing field. It was time to see what else these players could do. The next big push to beat Matt Turk's times came during one week in April 2014, where three of Turk's records were about to go down. It's here we see just how important McHazard's task was going to be. Coincidentally though, the first one had nothing to do with his tasks. I mentioned before there was a fourth record Turk had set that was at its theoretical limit. That fight was Great Tiger, with his time of 47.48. Remember how Don Flamenco has that frame perfect punch to get a star? Well, Great Tiger has four of them. After punching Tiger in the face, you dodge out of the way of his jab, then wait until the last frame before he would block and punch him in the face. If you hit the perfect frame, then you get a star punch, before having to repeat this process three more times in the first phase. Thankfully, phases two and three are free. Great Tiger gets up on a one count twice, which means a single star punch from Little Mac will send him down automatically. There's no randomness in this fight. And thanks to a couple of timing strategies Zaller discovered to time a couple of the punches late in phase 1, the only difficult part of the fight is the four face punches. But keep in mind, you have a 60th of a second to time each of them. Someone just had to grind the fight out until they got the four frame perfect punches, and on April 5th, Zaller was able to pull it off. He got a 47.48.
tying Matt Turk and the theoretical perfect time. Meanwhile, Sinister One was working on his own project. Matt Turk's Pissin Honda one time of 42.97 was a bit of a mystery, since it was one of very few fights where he didn't reveal his strategy. However, thanks to McHazard's new tasks, Sinister was able to come up with an even better one. Phase 1 was a variation of a strategy Sinister had discovered years prior, using heavy guard manipulation to sneak in punches all over and get stars. Key parts to this phase included landing a gut punch at the start with a 3 frame timing window, sneaking in an extra gut punch toward the end of the phase that had a 25% chance of going through, then not getting blocked at all on the last 3 face punches, which is about 50%. Honda gets up on a 1 count for phase 2 so a single star punch was enough to send him down right away. At the start of phase 3, Sinister would do a max damage star punch similar to the ones McHazard found on Piston Honda 2, then hit him in the face and do a couple of star punches. With a good health refill from Honda, it would be enough to get a low 42 second time and beat Matt Turk by just a little bit. The odds in getting this fight were under 5% from randomness alone, not taking into account the rather difficult execution. Nonetheless, Sinister very quickly got a run to Phase 3, but unfortunately the bad refill from Honda meant he had to delay a couple of star punches and get a 43 instead of a 42. Fuck. I got the bad refill. Yeah, 43 flat. God damn it. I got the bad refill, guys. Got the bad refill. Sinister was getting really close. He was now just three hundredths of a second away from taking another Turk time down. All he needed was to get that good refill in phase 3. But then, quite literally out of nowhere, this happened. Shouldn't I just quit right now? While I'm ahead? No, fuck that, let's do the Von Kaiser IL strat. Let's see if I can do it again. There we go. Holy fucking shit, dude. I think I just did it. <laughs> oh my god. What is happening? Oh, oh, oh. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my fucking god, dude. Oh my god. 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 <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my fucking god, dude. Oh my god. <laughs> How? How is this possible? If you recall from before, 35.97 matched Turk's Von Kaiser time. Where did that come from? Well, Mike Tyson's punch out has no level select, and you aren't allowed to use save states to get to whichever fight you want. There is a password system, but passwords only exist for a handful of the 14 fights. So the fastest way to get to Piston Honda was to start a new game and beat both Glass Joe and Von Kaiser before getting your one shot at Piston Honda. If it didn't work, you'd have to lose intentionally and then beat Von Kaiser again just to get another shot. Sinister randomly decided to go for this newly discovered Phase 1 strategy that McHazard had found, and it happened to pay off. It involved precisely tapping up at certain moments to manipulate Von Kaiser's guard up so that all of the punches went through. He also had to get a random 50-50 star in Phase 2, and very precisely duck under a punch in Phase 1 and Phase 3 by double tapping down. He also had to time the first punch of Phase 2 on the first frame possible. In order to get a 35.97, he had to lose no more than a handful of frames across all of those locations. And on literally his first attempt after getting the phase 1 strat to work, he got all of that. It was incredible. And a couple of days after that, Sinister was able to get his good refill on Honda 1. This is it. This is it. This is it. This is it. Rip, Turk, you are done. I got the 42. Fuck yeah. 0. 0.2 fucking 5, baby. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Get hype. And with that, over the course of four days, thanks to the combined efforts of Sinister, Zallard, and McHazard, three of Turk's times went down. But of course, Matt Turk still held six untied records, and the more they played, the more these six times seemed ridiculously impressive. 
Keep in mind that some of the game's top players have been trying for four years now, and they were only able to match or beat about half of them. Let's take a look at Turk's Don Flamenco 2 time, 123.97. This one was a bit of a unique case. Skill-wise, it was actually one of the easiest times in the game, but luck-wise, it was absolutely brutal. See, the way Don 2 works is whenever he's about to throw a punch, you can hit him while he's winding up either in the gut or in the face. On the first punch you throw, and every seventh punch after that, you'll get a guaranteed star. On every punch between, as long as you're holding a star, you have a 1 in 16 chance in getting another star. And believe me, that is horrible from a speedrunning perspective. For example, you can theoretically get 3 random stars in a row on Dawn 2, which would be great, but your odds in that are 1 in 4096. His health refill in Phase 2 is also random. There's a 1 in 8 chance he gives the lowest health refill, a 3 in 8 chance he gives a middle refill, and a 4 in 8 chance he gives the bad refill. If you press select before the fight to lower your health to half, as speedrunners often do on this fight, that also makes his phase 3 refill random, with just a 1 in 8 chance he gets up with the smallest amount of health. Why the programmers made Dawn 2 like this is unknown. It's not like anybody would pay attention to these random stars or refills when casually playing the game. But it leads to some pretty ridiculous fights if you get the luck. The tool assisted speedrun of Dawn 2 gets 5 random stars and both of the low 1 in 8 refills, achieving a time of under a minute. The odds of getting those stars and refills is about 1 in 6.7 million. Turk's 123.97 was much slower, but punch out players worked out that beating it still required odds of about 1 in 176. They would need a random star from one of the first two opportunities, then the middle 3 and 8 refill in phase 2, then finally the 1 and 8 low refill in phase 3. Someone just had to grind it out. And the guy who did it was a fairly unknown punch out runner named Kananaphone, whose specialty was speedrunning The Legend of Zelda. But he had also done some work in punch out, and for some reason he gravitated toward fighting Dawn too. And on May 28, 2014, after hundreds of attempts, he got all of the luck to align. Oh, yeah! There we go. There we go. Beat Dawn 2. He had only beaten Turk by one decimal, but that didn't matter. Dawn 2 was done, and another of Turk's times had fallen. Matt Turk still had five times left. These remaining times had each stood unbeaten for more than half a decade. In that same length of time, the Ocarina of Time record had been lowered by 55 minutes, Super Metroid had been lowered by 5 minutes, and Super Mario Bros. had been lowered by... well, 2 seconds. But the fact that even serious efforts from several of the world's top punch-out players hadn't been able to break these five times was just extraordinary. One of the most brutal times remaining was Turk's Bald Bull 1 fight. It featured a combination of crazy luck, really precise timings, and the need for persistence. Turk said it took him over 1,000 attempts to achieve this time. Keep in mind, to get an attempt at Bald Bull, you have to put in the password for Don Flamenco 1, then beat him, King Hippo, and Great Tiger. So, it took him a really long time to get his 58.99. The way he did it was by simply attempting to replicate the tool assisted fight as closely as he could. And it was a brutal strategy indeed. It involved needing 3 random 50 50 stars throughout the fight, 2 specific patterns from Bald Bull, and numerous frame-perfect or close-to-frame-perfect punches throughout. The odds worked out to just a 2.3% chance, or about 1 in 43. There's actually been some confusion over what Turk's exact time was, initially being reported as a 57.99, but years later being changed to a 58.99. But regardless, this time just seemed brutal to beat. And then McHazard came along and changed everything. In his tool-assisted speedrun, one of the eight fights that McHazard improved was Bald Bull 1. And a few months later, Zallard used it to do attempts to beat Turk's 58.99. McHazard's Phase 1 was discovered by Martin Charlebois 15 years before his task came out. 
It involved alternating face punches to get stars and using star punches into his rolling jabs. It was easy, it had no randomness, and it always got bowled down at 17 seconds with one star. Phase 2 was a bit tougher. You need a 50-50 random star at the start of the phase, then land a 2 frame punch just as Bull is lowering his guard and get another random star just after. You then need a 25% pattern where Bull throws more rolling jabs, and can send him down with 3 stars in your inventory. For phase 3, Zallard used a slightly safer version of McCasser's fight. To pull it off, you need the 75% pattern without rolling jabs, then depending on his pattern after, potentially need to land a frame perfect star punch after his uppercut. That's a 1 60th of a second window to time it. Across all three phases, that works out to odds of about 1 in 21, about twice as good as Turk's fight, and the execution was a bit easier too. So, Zallard set out to improve Turk's time, and on June 22nd, 2014, he came through and got a 57.00 beating Turk by nearly a full second. Keep in mind though, McHazard's task time was 55.25, so although Turk was off of his task by about 0.15, Zallard was slower than his by almost two full seconds. That's how much McHazard's strat was able to help. For Bald Bolt 2, it was once again McHazard to the rescue. Turk achieved his time of 121.82 by landing extremely random punches called bulldozers. When Bull's guard is down, if you hit him in the face but let go of up while the punch is going off, it's possible the punch will get through his guard and hit him for a star. Problem is, when I say possible, I mean it has a 1 in 16 chance of actually going through. It was possible to beat Matt Turk's time using two bulldozers and getting a specific pattern from Bull after, but the odds in it were over 1 in a thousand. So McCasser found a way around it. When Bull's guard is up, he found you can punch him in the gut and tap up while the punch is going off to potentially sneak the punch through his guard. It was called a misdirected gut punch, and you could do it whenever you'd normally do a bulldozer. And rather than a 1 in 16 chance in going through, the misdirected gut punch had a 1 in 4 chance. So instead of odds of over 1 in 1000 of beating Turk's time, the odds were only about 1 in 64. That was enough to get Sinister to start grinding to beat it. The execution wasn't too hard. The two rolling jab counters at the start were the hardest part, and they each had a 3 frame window. On July 5th, 2014, Sinister One took down Matt Turk's 11th world record. World record! World fucking record, dude! Yes! Fuck yes! 120.82 Thanks to McHazard, both of the Bald Bull records went down in the span of about two weeks. Matt Turk now only had three untied records to his name, Soda Popinski, Super Macho Man, and Mike Tyson. These three records had stood the test of time. These three records had stood through thousands of attempts from top players in the world. These three records stood head and shoulders above each of the other 11 records Matt Turk had set. To see why, let's take a look at that Super Macho Man time, 48.82. So, the good news about this fight. There's a password that you can put in that sends you straight there. That made it so you could do a lot of attempts really quickly. The bad news. The execution was really hard, and the luck needed was the worst of all 14 fights. Let's break it down. Macho's usual pattern is to throw 5 punches before standing still for a while in the build up to his mini spin pattern, where he spins around quickly and tries to punch you. For the first 5 punches of the fight, the 1st, 2nd, 4th, and 5th punches all need to be uppercuts for Turk's strategy to work. So Turk's strategy was to raise his guard and punch him in the gut, then intercept his first uppercut with a punch to the face before he ducks down. His second uppercut is then taken care of by raising Macho's guard to hit him in the gut again, then hitting him in the face before he ducks down. Punches 3, 4, and 5 are cancelled before you can throw them by hitting him in the gut. Then Macho stands still for his mini spin pattern. Turk unleashed a barrage of max damage star punches and punches to the face and gut, all while moving his guard around by pressing and releasing the up button at strategic times. In order to get all the punches in needed to knock him down, Macho needs to stand still for as long as possible, which is only about a 1 in 4 chance. 
So, altogether, not counting attempts missed for execution, there was just a 1 in 34 chance of getting out of the first phase of the fight. For phase 2, Macho once again needs to stand still long enough to sneak in enough punches and uppercuts, and 3 stars need to be in your inventory by the time Macho backs up. That bumps the odds up to just over 1 in 90. The execution on sneaking each punch in also needs to be tight enough for the clock to not roll over to 37 seconds before beginning a spin pattern. And to give you an idea of how hard that execution is, these are the inputs that need to be done to sneak in all of those hits. Macho's guard is in transition, so you begin the phase by pressing up and B to throw a face punch but must release up while the punch is being thrown so Macho doesn't raise his guard to block it. Then, the uppercut is done by pressing up and start but releasing up right after Macho brings his guard up so it does max damage. Then, a technique Turk invented called the Dizzy Destroyer is performed. You tap up, then immediately release it and throw a gut punch, then press up and beat to throw a face punch but let go of up while the punch is going off so Macho lowers his guard and the punch can hit his face. Finally, one more gut punch is snuck in by tapping up to bring Macho's guard up, then pressing B to throw the gut. That's a lot of inputs, and it's all performed right here at the start of Phase 2. Then, Macho backs up to go into a spin pattern. In Macho's spin pattern, he spins around between 3 and 8 times before stopping for you to land your star punch. The clock stays frozen this whole time, but in order to throw your star punch fast enough, you need to know when he stops instead of doing another dodge. The two ways to do this were, 1. To listen for the last spin punch, which is slightly higher pitched than all the rest. Or 2. Stare at the clock, and then as soon as it starts moving again, throw the star punch. Phase 3 is a repeat of Phase 2, except instead of needing the long delay before a spin pattern, you need the short delay, since Macho gets up with less health the second time and doesn't need to be hit as much. That pushes the odds to about 1 in 181 in getting the luck needed to beat Macho in 48 seconds like Turk did, not to mention the precise, tight, and essentially flawless execution needed the whole way through. So we're looking at odds of about half a percent, an execution harder than just about any fight in the game. Who would be crazy enough to try to top that? Well, Zallard won, of course. And he gets up. And I'm like, okay, star punch. And he's just like, nope! In the middle of 2014, Zallard began doing attempts to beat Turks 48.82. He was a veteran of the game at this point, so he saw results very quickly, getting times of 50 and 49 in July and August, respectively. These fights both lost time in Phase 2 because the clock ticked over to 37 before the spin pattern, meaning his execution was a little too slow. But hundreds of attempts later, that 48 was still untouchable. Zallard realized that tying Turk's time would be hard enough, but actually getting under a decimal of 0.82 was going to be essentially impossible unless he added in something that Turk didn't do. So that's what he decided to do. He would assume that Macho would stop spinning on the third spin punch of Phase 3, allowing him to throw the uppercut faster since he didn't have to wait for the audio or visual cue. This didn't guarantee a time under 0.82, but it at least gave him a better shot. Unfortunately, it made the luck needed even worse. Macho has just a 5 in 16 chance of stopping on the third spin punch, so the odds of the entire fight were now over 1 in 500. Zallard streamed some of his attempts to beat Turk's time, but most of the attempts just looked like this. This 48.82 was legendary. Zallard threw attempt after attempt at Macho, but it wasn't happening. He had to hit punch after punch be precise in every location, and wait for 1 in 500 odds. It didn't look like it was happening. And then, Zallard got this attempt past phase 1. Okay. Oh my god, at 25 with a star? That's fucking crazy. Fuck. Okay. Because I got that 25 that saved it. Yes! Holy 
shit, dude! Oh my god, please! Tie it, tie it! Tie it! As he sat there waiting for the time, he was praying that it was fast enough to tie a Turk's .82. But he knew there was a slim chance he had gone even faster and gotten a .61. All he could do now was wait for the fade out and see the blue screen. Holy shit! <laughs> oh my god! It's over! It's fucking over! You gotta be kidding me! <laughs> A 48.48. Turk's time wasn't tied. It wasn't edged out. It was thoroughly beaten by Zalard 1. 1 in 500 odds were defied, and Matt Turk now only had two untied records to his name. This 213 on Mike Tyson was, by a long shot, the hardest fight to pull off out of all 14. On Don Flamenco 1, Turk hit a frame perfect punch. On Great Tiger, Turk had to land 4 frame perfect punches. To get his 213 Tyson, Turk had to land 20 frame perfect punches. Tyson's pattern is to throw uppercuts for the first minute and a half of the fight. You can hit him twice after each one. The first one deals 5 damage as long as it's from the same side of the screen that Tyson threw from, and the second one normally deals 1 damage no matter what. However, if you delay this second punch to the last frame before he would block it, it deals 5 damage instead of 1. That's a frame perfect punch. You have a 60th of a second to time it. And for the first phase of the fight, literally all you're doing is landing frame perfect punch after frame perfect punch. Tyson begins the fight with 96 health. Since he could deal 10 damage on each punch Tyson throws, that means Tyson must throw 10 punches for you to be able to send him down the first time, and you need to be frame perfect on 9 of them to get an optimal first knockdown. Even if you hit the 9 frame perfect punches though, Tyson's pattern largely determines what time you get. He can randomly delay for an in-game second between certain punches, or potentially even do a long delay called the 8 second delay, which immediately kills an attempt. In Turks 213, he got a pattern from Tyson where he flat out didn't delay at all, a pattern that was only about 3.5% likely and led to a first knockdown time of 54 seconds. For the second phase, he gets up with 56 health. That means 6 punches from Tyson, and you need to be frame perfect on 5 of them. Tyson could give random delays here too. So what's important is that you get Tyson to throw that 6th uppercut before he switches his pattern from uppercuts to hooks at 130. As long as the uppercut comes out before 130, it's all good, even if the knockdown comes a few seconds later since you have to punch him down. Turk got one delay from Tyson in phase 2, but thanks to his perfect phase 1, it led to a blazing fast 128 second knockdown. In phase 3, Tyson switches to throwing hooks. If you wait to the last 60th of a second before hitting him after he throws a hook, that single punch will deal 5 damage. If you're early, you'll have to punch him twice for 4 damage total, and if you're late, you'll get blocked and deal no damage. These frame perfect punches are generally regarded as tougher to hit than the uppercut ones. Tyson gets up with 40 health for phase 3, so 8 frame perfect punches would be a perfect phase 3. Turk hit 6 frame perfect punches and got a bit of a slow pattern from Tyson, but it was enough to set a world record of 213. This 213 stood apart from his other records in a way. Its legacy reached far past his other 13 times, and for years it was just this impossibly fast time that the top players couldn't even get close to. Not only did it land 20 frame perfect punches, but the pattern he got from Tyson was just ridiculous. He achieved this time in December 2007, with knockdown times of 54, 128, and 213. As of mid-2014, nobody else had ever gotten under 55 for the first knockdown or 129 for the second knockdown. Turk not only was able to get that 54 and 128, but then capitalized on it in Phase 3 and played almost perfectly. Of course, other top players fought Tyson years later but their best efforts came up short. In February 2011, Sinister One set his long-standing personal best of 219. He got a second knockdown of 132 thanks to a slower Tyson pattern, 
and then hit 4 frame perfect hits in phase 3 to end up with his time. For years, that was the fastest time with video. Then, in April 2014, Zallard got a 217 with a 133 second knockdown. 6 frame perfect hits in phase 3 led to the fast time. But still, Turk's time from 7 years prior was 4 seconds faster. They couldn't touch it. It stood alone. But then, in July 2014, Sinister One decided he was going to try to do it. Nearly all of Turk's records had fallen by that point, but his 213 was still standing. Sinister had two viable paths to beating it. The first was the long shot, where he would get the second knockdown by 133, which didn't require too much luck, then hit all 8 frame perfect hits in phase 3. Hitting all 8 frame perfect hooks in phase 3 could save 5 or more seconds over Turk's phase 3, meaning his phase 3 pattern essentially didn't matter. Hitting all 8 frame perfect hits guaranteed he'd beat Turk, and could potentially beat him by several seconds. But of course, hitting all 8 was ridiculously hard, and had only been done a handful of times in the game's history over several years. So, he had another plan. The second method was what Sinister was aiming for. Getting a first knockdown closer to 130, then getting a better pattern from Tyson in Phase 3 and hitting 6 or 7 frame perfects like Turk did. He essentially just had to match Turk's execution, then get better luck at the end of the fight, and would end up with a time like 2.11 or 2.12. Sinister's personal best was a 2.19. Over the course of a few months in 2014, he put in thousands of attempts to beat Turk and get a 2.12 on Tyson. Here's how it went. Whoa, 218! I got a PB. <laughs> Yay, PB! <laughs> Wow, 216, dude, holy shit. I just beat Zaller. Oh my god, dude, oh my god, that was almost a 54. Yes, yes, dude, oh my god, PB. All right, at least I got a PB. Holy crap, man. Yes! Ah, I tied Turk at least, baby. I tied him. 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 Sinister had tied Turk's legendary 213, but he wasn't satisfied. He didn't want to match Turk. He wanted to beat him. It was 212 or bust. On September 6, 2014, the Punch-Out! community woke up to this. A 2.10, not a 2.12, achieved by Zallard, not Sinister. While all eyes were on Sinister, Zallard had quietly been doing attempts in the background. His personal best was a 2.16, 3 seconds behind Sinister, but on one magical attempt, he dropped it by 6 seconds after landing all 8 frame perfect hits off of a 132. It was the first time Zallard had ever hit all 8 in Phase 3. The 213 was done. Zallard was the new Tyson champion. And Turk only had one untied record to his name. Soda Popinski in 46.48. What was it about this fight that made it stand so long? Why did it outlast Don 2 with his absurd random stars? Why did it outlast Macho with the 1 in 500 pattern for the 48? Why did it outlast the 20 frame perfect punches on Mike Tyson? The answer was actually pretty simple. Nobody had any idea how Turk did it. Yeah, while Sinister and Zallard were spending months trying to beat each of Turk's 14 records, this one always just stood in the background. It was like a bad itch they just couldn't scratch. For all of the other 13 records, they at least had a path to beating them. 
They knew what he did and they knew how they could improve over it. For Soda Popinski, they had no idea. And since there was no video to go with it, they actually thought it could be a bogus time. Let's look at the fight itself. Beating Soda fast takes advantage of a bizarre, glitch-like mechanic. When Soda throws an uppercut, if you press down to block or duck, Soda freezes in place. You're free to hit him in the gut when he does, and the star you get from that punch will automatically knock him down no matter what. So you just do that once in each phase to beat him very quickly. Soda is also very random. He always starts each phase with two hooks, but then he only has a 75% chance of doing the uppercut pattern you need to beat him quickly. He can also randomly delay before the uppercut, with only a 25% chance he does the shortest delay. So you'd counter each of Soda's first two hooks, then duck and hope Soda does the fastest uppercut, freeze him in place to get the star, then cancel his next uppercut and use the star to send him down. And if you did that in each phase, your time would be 49 seconds. 3 seconds behind Turk. You couldn't cancel his hooks any faster. You couldn't force a faster pattern. A 46 was just too fast. And so, long after each of Turk's other 13 records were beaten, this one stood, and stood, and stood. And then, McHazard came to the rescue. By early 2015, Zallard was very interested in finally taking Turk's last time down, so he asked McHazard for some help in figuring out how. McHazard pointed out that there were aspects of the tool-assisted speedrun for Soda that could probably be utilized in a real-time run. Namely, getting the frozen punch for a start quicker. The old process was holding down, then waiting for his uppercut, then having him freeze and punch him in the gut. With McHazard's method, you could press down, then assume he does the shortest delay and press B to gut punch, then press down while the punch is going off to freeze him in place. This works to get the star just the same, and it saves about 2 seconds, meaning phases could potentially be just 15 to 16 seconds long. And as it turns out, this is likely the method Turk used to get his time. The problem was, even with this strategy, beating Turk's time would be incredibly tough. You need both uppercuts and the shortest delay for each phase of the fight, which works out to odds of 1 in 151. The execution was tricky too, since the input of gut punching then tapping down was very precise. And what's more, Turk's time of 46.48 was very optimized for this strategy, meaning his execution was probably really tight. But at least Sallard had a strategy now. On January 24th, 2015, he did attempts on Soda, with low expectations given the hard execution and 1 in 151 odds. But on attempt number 8, he was able to get out of phase 1. 15! We got one. Now we just need two more in a row. Oh shit, okay. Alright, um... <laughs> What? 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 <laughs> Alright. Okay, um... <laughs> By some miracle, it had taken Zaller just 8 attempts to get 1 in 150 odds. But this time fell short of Turk by half a second. And as Zallard kept playing, he realized that Turk's 46.48 seemed to have better execution than he could get with the strategy he was doing. A high 46 seemed way more likely than a mid 46. So he had reached a dead end. But just a few days later, someone found something huge. His name was Jack Wedge, and he had played the game alongside Turk more than a decade prior, at one point holding the Bald Bull 1 world record but he had come back all these years later to share a new strategy he had just discovered, the screwdriver. After canceling Soda's first two hooks, you could hold down a right dodge, then press B and then down to hit him in the gut right as Matt comes back to the center. 
This right dodge wasted the exact number of frames so that the gut punch hit Soda on the first frame possible to make the strategy work, guaranteeing the fastest phase possible. With this, Zallard knew he had a legitimate shot at beating Turk. He did more attempts to see what he could get. And on January 29th, 2015, he got this. Oh my god, dude. Is that it? Is that it? Holy shit. Holy shit. When Sinister One started to run this game in 2010, he had no idea what was in store for the future. Matt Turk's records were just too good. To quote himself, they had little to no chance at even sniffing some of those times. Instead, over the next five years, this is what the community accomplished. That's it. That's it. That's it. I just beat the fucking Taz. Oh my god. Oh. My. Fucking. God, dude. This is it. This is it. This is it. This is it. World record. World fucking record, dude. Yes. Yes. Holy shit, dude. Oh my god. Yes. <sighs> Holy shit. No fucking way. Yes. Holy shit. It's fucking done. It's fucking done, dude. Yes. Yes! 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 Fuck yes! 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 Fuck yes! It's over, dude. That's it. That is it. And with that, all 14 of Matt Turk's legendary times had been tied or beaten. It took half a decade, but thanks to the combined efforts of Adelicott, Jack Wedge, Kananaphone, McHazard, Sinister One, and Zallard One, this monumental task had been accomplished. In the years since, nearly every world record you've seen in this video has been broken. There's been huge advancements in strategy and improvements in execution as well. So, let's jump forward in time and take a look at how today's records chalk up to Matt Turk's times. Thanks for watching.